I'm genuinely thrilled for you to be able to listen in to this conversation that I have with Baxter Kruger. Honestly, I'm just asking questions and I am soaking in Baxter's deep wisdom as a theologian that comes from his ongoing heart connection with God's Spirit. And honestly, this man has the fruit of that Spirit. There is such kindness and humility and gentleness in him. Uh, Baxter received his PhD at King's College in Scotland. He's the author of nine books and he has all kinds of teaching resources available to you on his website at perichoresis.org and the link is down below. He's traveled the world for over 30 years proclaiming the good news of our inclusion in Jesus, which includes Christ's relationship with his heavenly father in the spirit. All of us are in the midst of a spiritual journey and it's one in which only Jesus can draw us further along as he, by the spirit, reveals things that we couldn't have known. So I just want to ask you to give yourself permission to wonder at the magnificence and the brilliance of God's plan to enter into our fallenness through the person of Jesus to bring us freedom from the inside out. Wow. Just how good is God? I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface, but what a great journey to be on. So thanks for watching and as always, feel free to comment down below. So I'm here today with Baxter Kruger, who is just uh, truly an amazing, amazing theologian and has uh, said he's very willing to come on and just just share with me some things. And I, I just got to tell you right from the beginning, Baxter, I am so, so appreciative of you uh, for in many ways being that, that one of the point people who, who've kind of given me some language on my journey of things I've needed to to learn but didn't have language for of just how good God is and and how good this story gets and of course we're gonna unpack some of that today but you you've really had a big impact on my life I just wanted to to really personally thank you and you have you've been definitely an influencer in my life and and again I'm someone that's been on this track a long time but but even from the first book you wrote, um, I don't know if it's the first book you wrote, but the first one I saw with the, the Shack Revisited, that's kind of, I think, when you kind of came on the scene, really, when a lot of people started to get to know who you were. I'm sure it wasn't your first book, but, but that really impacted me, um, Patmos for sure. And, uh, and then just more recently, Jesus and the Undoing of Adam, like that, it's just so good. I want to I get in, into some of those morsels with you. And um, I know that I know that you've taken your hits for this. Um, I so appreciate I so appreciate that. <laughs> I'm one of many who says thank you for taking the hits you've taken. Um, yeah, it's that's an interesting thing because I have, and it's been a long and winding road. But when you are as steeped in the Torrance brothers and then doing work on T.F. Torrance, my dissertation, you have to pretty much read everything, especially the early church. And you go back and read them. I mean, it's like, I don't know. Well, I do know how we got so far off. And I do know I figured all that out through time. But when um, it, I'll tell you an interesting story. I used to take for the first 15 years, um, I took T.F. Torrance's The Mediation of Christ and uh, Athanasius on the Incarnation of the Word with uh -huh. me everywhere everywhere I went and I would put them in the first pew leaning up facing me so that when I stood up to speak, I was looking at these two books because I knew uh, what storm was coming. And I thought I'm standing with those two brothers and not just those two that represents, you know, the, the early church Athanasius, of course, then TF Torrance, the modern 
uh, well, it represents the restatement of the modern of the ancient Catholic faith. Is he the evangelical faith of the ancient Catholic Church? Is the way he words it. So uh, there's confidence there that comes from them, from their work, and from steeping myself in what they said and Irenaeus and my, one of my favorites is Hillary. And then, of course, the Gospel of John and the Apostle Paul and now Douglas Campbell's work in New Town. I mean, it's it's not like I'm inventing stuff. I mean, this is, um, I think part of my contribution was being able to, was being willing to stand up and say it. And I think another part of it is that the Lord has, um, growing up in a small town in South Mississippi, there's a level of communication skill that develops naturally because you don't have enough people to divide into this intellectual group or this working of it. We're all just mixed together. So uh, I really appreciate that, the use of stories in the South. And um, so I, it's been a long and, and sometimes uh, painful road, but goodness, man, from where we are right now, she, I could do these things all day long. It's like, it's like, and then all the classes, you know, that I do online and essays and articles and stuff. It's like, okay, okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thrills me to see, to meet people like you. I'm like, come on, man. We'll have more Holy Spirit. Yay. <laughs> thank you. So <laughs> let's get into some of that because I know that some people who uh, are watching this may not even know yet what we are talking about. Um, I, I shared with you a little bit about my journey of kind of at, a, at some point being in a little more legalistic place and then more of a grace-based place, but still uh, not until the last handful of years have I been, my eyes been open to my origin as part of the, the Trinity, the Trinitarian Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, their eternal love that included me in them. And um, so I... I Honestly, I have to I have to make this admission to you, Baxter, that because you are I, I believe you're a brilliant theologian in 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 my opinion, <laughs> you just really are. God's blessed you with that ability to kind of see so many parts but be able to express things so well. Um, and so it's hard for me to know even where to begin uh, and and not just quote you everywhere, which would kind of defeat the purpose of talking to you. <laughs> so so um, but I think I think what would be Maybe a great place to start is 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 talking about uh, incarnation, which you know, which is uh, which typically we've said is is God in human flesh. And uh, but you've unpacked that so amazingly. I'm not. I'm gonna I'm gonna resist the the temptation right now to read some of your stuff and just ask you to talk about it. I may bring up a quote from from one of your books in a minute, but I think that might be a good place to start for those just thinking about their journey, their spiritual journey. And and uh, there's something about the incarnation, the way you share about it, that starts to open up whole new worlds of what Christ has actually done for us. So talk about that a little bit. I realize that's a huge subject, but let's start. We got to start somewhere. <laughs> well, it, you know, it, I got all that from the early church and from John and Paul. Uh, but essentially, if you stop and think about it, who is Jesus? Well, the scriptures are pretty clear about that. He's the Father's eternal Son. That the incarnation is not the beginning of the existence of Jesus Christ. He's the eternal Son of the Father, and He's the one who is anointed in the Holy Spirit from all eternity. So, it's revelation. Incarnation is revelation. It is saying to us in the world of darkness, "Hey, I'm going to show you who I am." And from the very beginning in John's Gospel, he starts out, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was." cross face to face with God turned towards mm-hmm. he was in the beginning he was God and he was in the beginning face to face with God all things came into being through him and John knows that we're kind of trouble with that so he repeats it not mm-hmm. one thing not one thing came into being apart from Jesus Christ not one right no person no thing this entire creation came into being in Jesus through Jesus by Jesus in the Father in the Holy Spirit so for me just parking there, it's like, okay, wait, 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 wait. Now we say, now, is this something that God just dreamed up after Adam fell? I mean, it's just like, oh, no, Adam fell. We didn't see that coming. And uh, No, this is a revelation to us about who God is from all eternity. That is Father, Son, and Spirit. That is this love relationship. That is this self-giving 
other centered care. The Father's not on a, high, a bigger chair, so to speak, than the Son, and and the Holy Spirit doesn't even really have a chair. It's, it's three persons in a circle of love. Mm-hmm. It's beyond definition. It's a mystery, but it's so beautiful, and it's ours. We see it. Jesus has revealed it. He said, this is who I am. I do not do anything that I don't see my Father do. Well, what is this mess you created? That's not what my father's doing. It's not what we're doing. So it's revelation to us of who God is and also revelation to us, the incarnation, the life of Jesus in the, in the flesh. Mm-hmm. It's revelation to us of what God has always wanted, and that is to be with us and for us to be with him. And so that reframes the entire story for me. So I don't see the cross as Jesus going to suffer the wrath of, of an angry God who is completely dissimilar to him because Jesus who knew no sin can become sin. The father supposedly can't even look at it. Well, what's the Holy Spirit do? So what's going on on the cross is, is what Athanasius, uh, or at least what one writer, Kali Anatolis said, this is the summation of Athanasius' thought is that the incarnation is the divine descent into our darkness. So the problem is that we have lost touch with who God is altogether. So had Israel and all the other religions in the world. This is the divine descent of Jesus Christ who is in the Father, not separated. They're indivisibly one. You can't have either of the three without the other two. So the incarnation is the divine descent not only of Jesus, but Jesus in his relationship with his Father, in his anointing with the Holy Spirit, to be with us in our darkness. And the cross is his submission to us to get to the very bottom of it. Mm -hmm. It's not about the wrath of God. It's the wrath of the human race. It's not about sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's about God in the hands of angry sinners. And he does that. He submits himself to us to be damned and cursed. And the Father is steadfastly turning our damning of his son into, he's transfiguring that into the renewed union, the new covenant. I embrace you here in your murder of my son, and I, I am who I, who I am. I am your father. I am his father. I don't do abandonment. I've got you here now. I embrace you in everlasting mercy. Everlasting mercy at your wicked worst, Baxter. Now get over yourself and, and look up, because I'm not disappointed, uh, and I've got you forever in my son in the Holy Spirit, just like it was planned before the foundation world. So just that alone reframes... Um, doesn't reframe the gospel. That is the frame of the gospel. It reframes the Western mind so that Christianity becomes about one thing. And that one thing is abide. So I tell people all the time, I, I, I hope I get to see the day. It's coming. But I hope I get to see the day where there are billboards all across the world. And all it says, Jesus is in you. Ask him. No dot, 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 visit the, this Jesus is in you, ask him. And then go down the road two miles. Ask Jesus if he brought his Father and the Holy Spirit with him. You know? And and it's because people are trying to be Christians. They're not trying to hear Jesus. Right. And when you ask him, Jesus, are you in me? You are going to hear him say, I am. I am. And I brought my Father and the Holy Spirit with me. Now let's talk. Now take sides with me. I get you out of this mess. I know where the green pasture is. Mm-hmm. And what we're busy doing religion, trying to tell people what to do, how to look, how to act. No, Jesus is saying, I'm here, guys. You see this in John when G, in John 6, when Jesus is going to train, uh, feed the 5,000 men, 30,000 people probably. And he turns to Philip and to, to Andrew, I think, and he says, hey, guys, uh, these people are hungry. And Philip's like, Jesus, we had a whole year's salary. We wouldn't be, be have enough to buy a speck of food for all these people. And Andrew says, well, there's a kid, there's a kid here that has a few barley loaves and a few fish. And he well, what is that? And, and the, the unstated message there that begins that magnificent chapter six, where you have the crossing of the sea, the feeding of thousands, and, and then the bread of life discourse, that it's all said right there in that moment. Jesus is saying, guys, God, listen to me. Lesson one of discipleship. I am here. Mm-hmm. I am here, not absent. So lesson one is recognize my presence. And lesson two, assess no situation as if I am absent and not good. 
That's good. That that's it. That's the Christian life right there. <laughs> Baxter, assess no situation in your life, no moment, as if I am not in you and I'm not good and I didn't bring my Father and Holy Spirit with me. So learning to live, and I, I mean, it's taken me all these years to, to turn the kaleidoscope back in line with the early apostles and the early church. And now new questions emerge, and that question is, Jesus, how do I live in you? I don't want to make this up. I'm not trying to be a Christian. I'm not trying to listen to somebody's definition of what holiness is. Jesus, I don't know what holiness is. You do. You know where the green pasture is. I mean, I used to think of my my inner world was like a box of loose coat hangers, all shaken and disturbed. Or if you've ever seen a box of brim hooks, I, and I but I thought my job was to figure it all out and get them lined up. And I finally realized I don't even know the order. Jesus, here's the box. You you yeah. move the first one first because I don't know how to do this. And let yeah. me tell you, I mean, one other thing. You cannot hide relief. You cannot hide being relieved from the exhausting notion that I am separated from God and I've got to get back. And you not only cannot hide relief, you that's freedom. Because if I if I'm trying to get back to God, I'm gonna buy into somebody's definition of how to do that. That's very different than Jesus, are you in me? Now, Jesus. I have been relieved of religious duty. I get to walk with you. I don't know how to do that. Would you teach me? So good. Back. So beautiful. good. Yes, it is. I, you just said so much right there. I, I, you, In fact, you even got to the ending. I was going to say at the end, you know, when we talked to all these theological ideas to say, and what does this look like in your life? And you just said what it looks like, that you don't consider a moment when that he is not present and um anyway I, that's that's even brilliant. even and especially well i'll make two comments on that yeah. even especially in your sin it, this is the kicker that jesus is not ashamed to call me us brother mm -hmm. you've lost your mind baxter but you're my bride and i don't do abandonment just like my father did and the other thing to be emphasized is what i'm saying is every single person on this planet is included in this and Jesus is in them and he brought the Father and the Holy Spirit and that reveals to us how far we've lost our minds. But it's okay. Everybody is included in this. And when we see that, it instantaneously changes all the isms. There are no more isms. The early church exploded. And if you think about it, the first three years or the first three centuries, I should say, uh, there is no rational reason that the Christian church should have exploded. Because if you, in that context of the first three centuries, if you became a Christian, if you became a follower of Jesus, you would likely lose your family, certainly lose your job because you would no longer participate in the wild guild parties. And there was a good chance you'd die. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, what? And, and when Paul says in Corinthians, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling in order that your faith would not rest on the dazzling rhetoric of a, of a man, but on the demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles proclaim Christ in you, the hope of glory, or John proclaimed in that day, you will know that I am in my father, you're in me and I'm in you. When they preached that something happened inside of people, it was the witness of the Holy Spirit to reality, and it blew their mind and astonished their hearts, and it relativized everything else in life. This right. I'm I'm in, and you put you put people in a room when that kind of internal witness and and knowing is happening, and it is electric, and things happen, and people are healed. And I mean that's but right now we're reading the story from a lack of experience of most all of that. So I, I've been, my prayer has been, I don't know what exactly Paul meant by demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit, but I've been asking my whole adult life, I want, I want that. Holy Spirit, I want that. I want that. So as the gospel is recovered, we begin to realize Jesus is in us, and he brought his Father and the Holy Spirit with him. Now we can begin to ask him, and as we hear him, something's happening inside of us. And then as we teach this, something begins to happen inside of other people. That's right where we are right now across the world yeah uh, it's it's not a local thing Ooh. so i'm curious i know this is so good baxter i i'm curious then uh you know what what we have 
more traditionally, maybe evangelically, have called the salvation experience, you know, where we're, um, as I think, as you've said, we're, we're inviting in an absent Jesus, which is, which is a real problem. Um, and so what would you say, you know, for someone like myself or, or many others who have had some, a, some kind of a dramatic awakening, you know, just share a little bit more. What, what's, what do you think is actually going on? You just talked about kind of what's happening as people hear it and something's happening in them. I, I'll just say two things. First, um, I got, I have, Beth and I have uh, three children. And between the three of them, we have six grandchildren. They all live near us. And I just am curious when any of them prayed to receive me into their life. <laughs> I mean, how stupid is that? I mean, how blind is that? I mean, we're talking about Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the creator and sustainer of all things. We were created in him. Mm-hmm. We, we are in him. We live and move and have our being in him. It's not up there watching from a distance and we're down here like ever ready energizer bunnies that he gave a battery pack to and we just run around for a few years. Now we're breathing Christological air. That's the only air there is. You don't get to be part of Jesus's creation without Jesus. So we've got it backwards there. Now I've had at least three or four monumental experiences in my journey. I don't remember a time that I didn't believe in Jesus. I mean, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church, memorized the confession, catechism, all that stuff. Uh, I, but I met something happened when I was in college, and my friends around me said, "Oh, you got saved." Oh, okay, I got saved. Well, then about two years after that, something else happened it, that made me think the first one didn't take. But then people said, "No, you got the Holy Ghost." And I'm like, "Okay, I got the Holy Ghost." Well, then when my son was born, I. I mean, I had to pull over on the side of the road. I could not drive. It was like the the whole creation stopped and clapped its hands. And 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 I'm like, wow. So I'm just thinking the whole time. So I find, I'm in Scotland. He's born in Scotland. And um, I'm in church on Sunday morning, Church of Scotland Church. Um, and my wife and I are sitting there, and I start laughing. This is this was 20 years before I ever heard anything about that kind of stuff. And uh-huh. so I, and I, I'm shaking visibly. And she says, are you okay? And I said, no. She said, do you need to leave? And I said, I, I, if I can't, and, I, and I, I finally calmed down. It started again. And I mean, I was, I was laughing, not out loud, but so much that my body was moving. And I, 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 I started to make a move to get up and I finally calmed down. And then afterwards she said, well, what was going on? I said, I have no idea what that was. It wasn't bad, but I got home and after dinner, lunch, I uh, went up to my little room where I was working on my dissertation. And I said, I said, Lord, what, what in the world? And, and I heard, you know, pull out the bulletin. So I pulled out the bulletin. And I read it, you know, first thing, traditional Presbyterian church. The first thing there is the invocation whereby the congregation led by the pastor invokes the presence and the blessing of God upon this thy service of worship. And I started laughing again. And I, I said, he just said, and I could hear it as clear as anything, Baxter. So you and Beth and all those people got up this morning and in your own strength and out of your own heart and its desire for goodness, you got up, put on your best clothes and came to worship me. And I'm up there. I said, it's the other way around. It's me. I'm the one to put this in your heart. I put it in everybody's heart. They got up together. They're already, I, I've invoked their presence mm-hmm. with me and my Father and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You're not getting me to come down to be part of something. If I wasn't here, every single person on earth would be catatonic in the corner. Right. We'd be afraid to move, scared that we would be obliterated. And so well, it was a continuum. It is, I'm in Jesus, I was born in him, and he's teaching me, he's educating all of us to become true sons and daughters in the sense that we love with their love, we're good with their goodness, and and their monumental experiences all all along the way. So why would we stop with four? I, I mean, if the Holy Spirit is in Jesus in me, why should I not expect a whole lot more going on in my life? So I'm I'm on one side, I'm thrilled about it. On the other side, I'm asking, Lord, I, I want to see this mm-hmm. in me. 
So, yeah, I, I, now how people label that, um, J.B. Torrance always said, you know, uh, just don't build your theology on, on your experience and its interpretation. Build your theology on Jesus. So I see this as from the moment of conception through our entire life, we're being educated by the Holy Spirit, and we're going to have more and more and more profound and simple experiences. And the big one, mm -hmm. the big one that's coming is that we will be stunned silent. Mm -hmm. People will get together on Sunday morning or whatever time it is, and they will be stunned silent at the goodness of the Father's love and at the humility of our brother Jesus and at the patience of the Holy Spirit with us in our stupid, what George McDonald called spiritual stupidity. <laughs> I mean, it's like we're not going to laugh. We're mm -hmm. not going to be able to open our mouths. That's what's coming. And we're not creating that. The Holy Spirit is leading us there. Wow. That's uh, that's amazing. I, that picture you just painted, I'm like, yes, yes, Lord, I, I let's have that. Let's have that. You know, I've been a, a pastor for 40 years about, um, you know, from <laughs> interning all the way up to current. But uh, but man, you know, along the way, all of the all of the rituals and the ways in which we've we've tried to do things just right to get an outcome and man that's exhausting and and more recent history has just been enjoying more and more enjoying the father as he enjoys me enjoying jesus as he enjoys me holy spirit the same and uh so yeah that baxter that just sounds glorious to me now there's a time in my life where i might have been a little bit um I don't know, like uh, thinking, shoot, what's my part then? You know, now I could care less. <laughs> I just well, hey, let me give you an illustration of it. my my friend Nan. She she has the the closest, simplest, most real relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit of anybody that I've ever met. And um, and she's like, Baxter, I don't know the Bible like you do, and I'm not a theologian. I hadn't read Athanasius and all these people, and I'm just a little old Nan. And I said, Nan your face glows. I said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be in the grocery store and you're going to be looking at soups and you're going to, you're going to be in your own world. And some lady's going to walk up to you and y'all going to end up in a conversation. Now that lady doesn't know consciously that she's feeling the river or living water flowing from you or the light of life coming out of your face, but she's drawn. You're going to end up in a conversation and you're going to end up in the parking lot and you're going to end up praying for her. And then before long, she's going to start coming to your house to, to read and study things together. And before long, you're going to have a whole bunch of people. And it wasn't two weeks. She phones me up. She's back, you're back. You're not going to believe where I am. I said, yeah, you're in the parking lot. She said, it happened. He, I, see, I wasn't looking at soups. I was just in, in the grocery store, and it just happened. I said, Dan, that's because you've been educated to be a true daughter of the Father in Jesus. It's not about how much you know Bible-wise, or if you've been educated. Those things are great, but they're not needed. You know them, and you walk with them, and you can't hide it. And, and all you did was, in your freedom of peace in your soul, all you did was notice now, if you're eating alive with anxiety and you're frantically running through the grocery store, you don't see anybody else, let alone free to respond. But look how that freedom to respond led into a newfound relationship. And look, and we don't even know where it's going to go. I mean, that, that, that lady's son, who's 10 years old, may be the next John the Apostle. I mean, it's, but this is the way it really works. When your inner world has calmed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You notice, you notice pain, you notice sunshine, you notice animals, you notice, th and you're free to respond. And because you're not alone, your response is all taken up within their response. And it's just, and that's the, that's when you look at the apostle Paul's life, that dude had no marketing group. He didn't have a plan. He went over here and somebody says, you got to go see Lydia. She's the seller of purple died. And, I can't remember where she was, Philippi. And so you got to go by and see her. And here's here's a letter from me because it just next thing you know, he's made this journey. And then he goes, I'm going to go back. And he came back and exhausted. So he 
you know, rest up. Yeah, I'm go back and I'm going to extend. And he didn't have a plan, but look at what the Holy Spirit was doing because the Holy Spirit's present, not absent. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit's determined that we come to know the truth and be set free by it. Yeah. And, it, it, it and John and all of them, I mean, they just, they just, they just abide. They were abiding in the, in the, in the marvel of Jesus love and they noticed and things happened. Mm -hmm. That's so good. You, as you were sharing that, uh, that abiding, uh, sorry, I'm just actually taking it in for a minute. I'm like, Oh, just let it sink in. This is all so good. Um, I was thinking about, uh, I think I read an article. It might've been on your website, uh, perichoresis.org. And I think it was uh, about explaining that word, perichoresis, which I would love for you to do since that's the name of your ministry, why you chose that, that Greek word. And because I remember the story, at least the article I was reading about a woman that was kind of feeling like her life was a waste because she was just taking care of her kids. You remember this one buying a coat or whatever? Just oh, yeah. I want you to share that story because I think so many people listening, uh, again, what does this look like in daily life? How can I actually s enjoy what Jesus said I was going to get to enjoy, which is life abundant? Let, let me, I'll, I'll try to limit myself to two stories on this because this is, okay. first, the first one was, uh, I think I was in Australia. It's been probably 20 years ago, but I, I've been down there a bunch through the years. And, and I finished speaking. We were having tea and biscuits. And this Asian lady came up to me. And she's holding a baby and she's just bawling. I mean, just like bawling, crying. And I'm, I'm like, somebody died or something. I don't know her. Um, and she introduced herself and, and I said, well, just, just calm down a minute. Tell me what's going on. And she finally was able to calm down. And she said, Baxter, she said, there are two Pentecostal churches in our area our town, uh, and our, our Holy spirit churches. And we have both, both churches have been praying and fasting for over a year for the Holy ghost to fall. And I almost laughed. I thought the Holy ghost to fall you see that right there it's already absent and she said the holy ghost fell on the other church and not on ours and we're devastated and our pastor asked me he said if you get a chance to ask baxter why ask him so she's it's like why did the holy ghost fall on them and not us hmm. and i said well well I, in my mind i'm saying holy spirit it's about time for you to show up now with some insight here. And, and, uh, cause I don't, and, uh, the whole, I, I looked at it and I said, I don't know what you mean by the Holy Ghost falling, but you've obviously associated that with certain phenomena. And that well, may well be the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit's way bigger than that. She says, What are you talking about? I said, Is this your baby? She said, Well, of course it is. I said, Do you love this child? She said, well, of course I do. I said, you pretty much give all your time every day to taking care of that baby, don't you? She said, well, yeah. I said, let me tell you, in 10,000 years from this very moment, when that town is probably gone, those buildings are gone, and whatever you meant by the Holy Spirit falling is gone, this child you're holding in your arms will still be calling you mama. Mm -hmm. Because in your union with your husband, the Father, Son, and Spirit has created a human being who will never disappear throughout all eternity. And you don't see that as the Holy Spirit. You've, so first thing is don't identify the Holy Spirit alone with these certain things. I don't have an argument with those. I'm just saying open your eyes because the only thing that's going to be here in 10,000 years is us. And that child and all the rest of your children are going to still be calling you mama because that's who you are in the Holy Spirit. And she's like, Looked at me like I said, "Yeah," I said. That now, now we see every single baby born is coming through union of a man and a woman, and and, and the Holy Spirit is doing something there that only the Holy Spirit can do. The Holy Spirit is the Lord and Giver of life, of course, mm -hmm. in Jesus and the Father. Mm -hmm. That's that's story number one. Is we got we got to rethink what we mean by the presence of the Holy Spirit, and and open our eyes to see much much. Uh, a, a much bigger picture that incorporates our humanity 
everything, supper, etc. So the other story, uh, and this is in my book, The Secret, um, short book, one of the first things I wrote. You know, I worked for a few years in a church after I came back to the States. Um, and um, I was in my office, and I think it was a Monday. And this young lady that I knew came in, knocked on the door, came in. She had a stack of newsletters, you know, at least that thick, if not thicker, in her hands around Christmas time. And she walked in and she slammed them down on my desk and, that, and the things just went flying. And I'm, I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And she said, I, I've been reading these newsletters from Christians and missionaries all over the world and their wonderful life that they're living. And she said, for Pete's sake, even their children are perfect. And huh. she said, it just hit me what a worthless life I have. And I said, what, what, what do you mean? She said, for Pete's sake. She said, I do three loans of laundry a day. And when I'm not doing the laundry, I'm grocery shopping. And when I'm not grocery shopping, I'm cooking the groceries. When I'm not cooking the groceries, I'm cleaning up after cooking the groceries. When I'm not cleaning up after cooking the groceries, I'm trying to keep my house somewhat presentable and keep these kids on, on schedule for whatever they may be trying to do. She said, I don't, I'm, I'm by the end of the night, I'm too tired to even read my Bible. What do I possibly have to offer God? I'm like, another one of those moments in the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, <laughs> it's time for some revo here. You know, it's like, um, and I looked at her. And I said, I remember yesterday you and so-and-so and so-and-so were all talking and you were all excited about this coat that you had found for your daughter. And you said, and you were, she looked at me like, yeah, well, I said, you were fired up. You got up that morning and you wanted to get your daughter a coat and, and one that she could wear this year and next year. And I remember you said, and, and not look like it this year and one that was on sale and you shopped maybe not all day, but for a long time. And you found the coat and you were all excited about showing it to your friends. And she looked at me like, well, what, what are you talking about? I said, I said, my question to you is, did you wake up yesterday morning and take a good mama pill? <laughs> and she said, what, what? I said, did you wake up and take it? Oh, did you just have a special prayer time and rededicate yourself to motherhood? She said, no. I said, no. I said, there's only one good shepherd in this world, and that's Jesus. And he doesn't need you to make babies. He doesn't need you to feed them. He doesn't need you to clothe them. But he doesn't like to do things alone. He's always doing things with his Father and the Holy Spirit. And because you and I are in him, he's sharing those ideas with us. So I say, you woke up. Jesus shared his burden for your daughter, which is his sheep, to have a new coat that she would like. And you were thrilled. And you gave yourself 100% and it accomplished the task. And she said, it's not, a, I said, it's not about you offering anything to God. It's about you participating in their burdens and joys. And you don't know it because the church has defined things as sacred and secular. You, mm -hmm. you know, missionaries top notch, senior pastors next notch in, in Bible study and, and church attendance and all that. That's all counts as, as, sec, as sacred. And then motherhood and fatherhood and friendship and cooking supper and all that's just, you know, that's a second tier down. That, it's okay, but it's nowhere near this. And I said, you bought that hook, line, and seeker like I have, and it's a, it's a complete lie. The Father, Son, and Spirit do not need you to feed their children. They do not need farmers. They do not need people that design, design farm equipment. They do not need um, uh, people to farm and, and plow and plant seeds and all. But they don't do it without us. And Carl Barth said, God has chosen not to be God without us. You see this in Jesus transforming the water into wine. If you can transform water into wine, why do you need servants to get water? Just walk up there and create wine. Well, he's not going to walk up there and create wine because that would be to presuppose that these people around him are not in him. And he's up there and giving instruction. He's not, I'm going to change this. I'm going to deal with this situation. And I want you to get to water. If I would have been one of the servants, I'd have been complaining about water is heavy. This is 180 gallons worth of wine, but he, Jesus gave them a participation in what he was doing. And you better believe that from that moment on in that community, everybody knew who those servants were. They were the ones that got water for Jesus, and he did something with it that only he could do. And that's the world we live in, our humanity, our fatherhood, our motherhood, our friendship, that call at 3.30 in the morning, making bread, fishing, all of this. 
is part of the divine life of the Father, Son, Spirit that is freely shared with us. And we're clueless about it because we think God's up there and we got we got left with them. Christianity has been reduced to uh, the Bible and figuring out what the principles in the Bible are. And your Christian experience of Christian life is no better than your, your ability to apply the principles to your life. And good luck with that. Mm-hmm. Good luck. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm curious. Uh, did you, did, were you going to explain uh, just a, give a definition for peri, uh, perichoresis? Yeah, um, yeah. I would love for you to do that just because it's such a, you, you, yeah, it's a word that people don't use and yet you used it for your ministry, which means it's pretty important. So how would you just in a simple way to find that for people to grab a hold of? Union with no loss of distinction of persons. Uh, mutual indwelling with not absorption. Mm. It's a word that they came to in the early church because they were trying to come up with, they were trying to think through the implications of Jesus's identity. You cannot speak of Jesus in the New Testament without saying Father, Son, and anointed one. So what's the relationship? And when Jesus in John talks about, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, um, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing from that moment on, uh, in, intuitively, the search is on in the early church to come up with a concept that will allow that for us to think about this. And that concept, it took, it took centuries, um, but that concept is the word perichoresis, and, and our perichoresis is the way it should be saying, but I'm Southern, so um, uh, it means mutual indwelling without loss of personhood. So it gave a, a, a vocabulary and a conceptuality to the, to the church to be able to say God is three persons who dwell in one another and who so perfectly dwell in one another. And there's no shadows, there's no clouding, there's no hiding. This is a relationship of love that is so pure and deep and beautiful and unclouded. The only way we can talk about it is to say they're one. So mutual indwelling without loss of personhood. Jesus never becomes the Holy Spirit. The Father never becomes Jesus. There's a distinction of persons that's holy and safeguarded, but it is oneness. So the early church basically took the concept over a period of decades and centuries of, of Israel's hero, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, uh, which has already got plurality b- built within it. But they took that one. God is one. one. But Israel meant by that one person. And the Greek, the Greek world saw whatever they meant by the one as being so far removed from everything else and it's undivided so they were just hearing rank heresy from the church when it worshiped not only the Father, but the son and the holy spirit and so what happened is as they as they developed the, the concept they took the word one which they uh the the um Greeks meant indivisibly and Jews meant one person and they baptized it into relationship and filled it with meaning of oneness so when with one God, we're talking about a relationship that's so beautiful they dwell in. Now, when I first started, when I first came across that term, it's 40 years, 40 something years ago, I thought, oh my goodness. I, I don't care. People laughed at me, said, Baxter, people can't even spell that word, can't pronounce it. I said, Yeah, you can't spell oncologist till you need one. But I'm gonna make that word a household name again, because it was. Mm. It wasn't one point. And we we just lost our minds in our abstractions and deism <laughs> bless our hearts but but the holy spirit's right on schedule and, and new days are here okay wow put that more concretely when one person weeps the other the others taste salt mm. this wow. is why this is why the 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 so-called modern doctrine of penal substitution is such a blasphemy because jesus says it I only do what I see my father doing. The hour has come and now is when you, my disciples, will scatter and each will go to your own home. Leave me alone. But I am not alone. The father is with me, meta, united with me. And so is the Holy Spirit. Where was God when Jesus was on the cross? God was in Christ. Reconciling the world. Yes, this is the descent of that perichoretic oneness and divine love into the abyss 
of our darkness so that that light can be shared with us as sinners and broken people. People have lost their minds and we can begin to take sides with Jesus and walk with him and, and experience the life that he promised with his father. Okay. I got, I have to read that. I, I was, I was resisting the temptation all day, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to read from uh, your book, Jesus and the undoing of Adam, but it's my uh, wife's favorite by the way. Oh man. It, I could read from a lot of them, but this one really wrecked me in a great way. But the, what you just said about entering into our darkness, I, I just got to tell you that I could know about that concept my whole life. And never until I read this right here did I understand this, the depth of the aspect of this. I'll just read a couple lines. Uh, the, Jesus sees what Adam sees. This is about the incarnation again. In entering into Adam's world, the Spirit of God enters into Adam's fallen mind. And a page later, he took upon himself our fallen flesh. He stood in Adam's shoes, in Israel's shoes, in our shoes, and he steadfastly refused to be like Adam. Step by step, blow by blow, moment by moment, he refused to believe in the God, small g, of Adam, and he loved his father with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. I don't think I ever grasped, really, even though he took on form of humanity, you know, all, all of that, but that he took on our distorted mind, our, our distorted concepts of who God was. Somehow he took that on, yet did not yield to it. But I, there was just something about that that was... Mm. A whole paradigm shift for me to realize, wow, that was the extent to which he entered into our fallenness. So thank you for that. Yeah, he got to the bottom. Otherwise, um, he turned over every leaf in our fallen and broken minds so that there's no one and no part of any human being who's beyond the presence of Jesus and his light and his relationship with his father. That's why it was so important that if you think about it, um, why the violence around the death of Jesus? Um, he's mocked. He's spit upon. He's called all manner of names. He's hit in the face brutally. The crown of thorns with thorns as long as your finger jammed onto his head. There's blood everywhere. He's flogged, scourged, which means, you know, that thing with those basically cat of nine tails kind of thing would come around his body and go all the way to the back. And when it was going back around, it's taking flesh with it. And, and the Jews considered um, 40 of those kind of lashes to be fatal. So they never hit more than 39 times, but this was the Romans and they didn't count. So you, you know, when it says in the Psalms, I can count on my bones this is the truth. He could see his kidneys wow. uh, and, and it's blood everywhere. And you think, well, what's that? What, what is going on here? The old Testament, the high priest would slit the throat of the animal, let it bleed out, take some of the blood into the Holy Police. New Testament, we have rage. We have intense wrath being poured out upon the eternal son. We have beating. We have collusion between the, the, the Jewish elite leadership and the hated pagan Gentile Romans. I mean, how does that happen except it's a manifestation of the hatred of the human race toward their misunderstanding of the true God, and they pour their wrath out on him. He submits to it. Now he's on the inside of our delusion. I mean, I, I've been, I've been, I got a call one day uh, from the psych unit here at a local hospital, and a friend of mine was in the psych unit. I didn't know about it. And, and they, and they said, she's asking for you. Can you possibly come down here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a PhD in theology. I'm not a medical doctor. And he says, no, she's asking for you. So I get huh. down there. I walk in the room. She recognizes me, speaks directly to me, comes over to me. There are three nurses in the room. You can tell they're on red high alert because there's been some real craziness going on. And she says to me, um, I'm, they won't let me go get dressed. I don't even have my dress. I don't have any makeup, and I'm trying to get dressed. I said, what do you get dressed for? And she said, well, the ball. You got an invitation, too. It's a red carpet ball. The limousine's going to be here in two hours, and I don't have anything to wear, and, and they won't let me leave, and I'm just, you know. And she was just detached from reality, and it's sincere. Mm -hmm. serious. And, boy, I knew this is, this is, I don't know how to handle this, and and so the minute I disagreed with her interpretation of reality, 
reality, she turned on me like she turned on the nurses and everybody else and basically told me to get the hell out. So I left, and I'm walking down the hall, and I get in the car, and I just sit there, and I, I think, Jesus. And then I, I thought, that's the fall. That's the fall. It's not that, that that woman has done something wrong. She surely will do a bunch of stuff wrong in a mindset like that. But the wrongs are not the point. The point is the delusion. The question is, how in the world do you get, do you fix that? Because everything I would say to her is filtered through her conclusions. Right. And even if you disagree, she just kicks out. So mm-hmm. you got to have some kind of profound entrance of light on the backside of her filters. And I thought, that's, that's the incarnation and life and death of Jesus and his mm-hmm. descent. He's not going to go into the psych unit and talk to her. He's not going to send her an inerrant Bible. He's going to go himself and find his way inside of her delusion so that a new conversation can begin to happen. That's the it. That, so Jesus and the undoing of Adam was the first, um, my first uh, attempt at, at talking about that. Then comes across all worlds, which is Jesus inside our darkness. Then comes Patmos, <laughs> which is a novel. And um, I think you, you probably you said you'd read it, I think, hadn't you? Loved it. Yep. Well, here's something. This is this is pretty exciting. This is the screenplay for Patmos. Ooh. Wow. I've been I didn't I didn't write it. A guy named Graham Sellers wrote it, but I've been I've been just editing what I could and I've sent back to him and he's working on the next step and we've got people in line that are pretty excited about wanting to make this happen. And I, my wife and I were watching a movie on television the other night and I just started crying because I thought this is going to happen. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to get to see, we're going to get to see deluded Aiden burned out suicidal theologian who time <laughs> travels end up with John, the apostle on the Isle of Patmos. We're going to get to watch that. And, <laughs> gosh. So anyway, the question is delusion. Love it. That, that's the fall of Adam. Yeah. So it was never about how can I get my father to accept these people that he doesn't like and now have offended him. It's how the father says, how can we get our forgiveness inside of behind their delusions so they can receive it and believe it and experience it? So it's, you know, either we see Jesus as just one more doomed prophet who came, who preached, who taught, who loved, even sacrificed his life. But in the end, he goes back and says, Father, I did everything that I knew to do everything you told me to do, but in the end, they didn't want me. How it's either that or no, there's more going on here right. in this extent. And that's why we can ask Jesus. And when you have people that are, that are lewd, you know, you, you know that Jesus is on the other side of their filters. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm just, if that happens to me again, I'm just saying, Jesus, what, what would you have me say? What would you have me do? More than likely, most it's be, it'll be a big a big bear hug a Paul Young bear hug, right? You know? <laughs> well, I would I I wish Baxter I had about three more days here <laughs> to to talk with you because um, well, is... let me tell you you can you, okay gonna, that, I was going to ask you to talk about that we well I I um, I'm not traveling as much now I do more online classes but I do travel usually about once a month and so next May. Uh, this will be available on our website soon. Um, we, we have our annual men's conference in Tennessee. And um, I've asked John Crowder and Warren Sylvester, a, mu- a brilliant musician. Uh, and he and John and I are going to teach on the Holy Spirit. So it'll be Friday night, all day Saturday, half a day Sunday um, in a barn in Tennessee. We, we get together. So that's one one place that's welcome. Um and then uh, everything else will be posted on our website. So, and we've got lots of, like I've got essays. This this essay right here is is a new book, and it's just being edited. And it's the mediation of Jesus Christ. It's kind of the summation of everything that that I've learned in one package. I think it's like thirty pages, single space. So, um, it's a it's a humdinger. I was just reading through it again this morning. So, there's uh-huh. another essay called God in the Hands of Angry Sinners. Um, there's an, a new introduction that I've written to George McDonald's unspoken sermon. There's a bunch of stuff that's available and our YouTube channel, which is, uh, I don't, David Peck is the one that's done all that, but apparently it's doing quite well. But is that uh, called perichoresis, the YouTube channel? Astonished heart. Astonished, Astonished heart. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, back, Baxter Kruger, Sun Shark. So okay. um, I'll put all these links down below for those of you who are listening and. And uh, on your, yeah, because on your website, perichoresis.org, uh, which I'll also put a link down below, but you have, like you just said, online courses. You have an online community if people want more interaction, connection with people. Because I, I, as we said earlier, there's just a growing number of people who are finally awakening because of the, the, uh, the beauty of, of God who refuses to give up on us and keeps pursuing us, that his spirit is opening up our eyes to a greater truth that we just weren't aware of. And I just, I just want to thank you again for championing that and, and, um, and for, for persevering. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and as you have, you know, of course, then comes new layers and new layers of revelation because God has a son he can trust. Uh, mm. So thank you, Baxter. I really, really appreciate you. Well, let me let me just say two other. Uh, there's one class called Introdu Introducing Trinitarian Faith, which is lectures thir uh, eleven lectures that I did in Toronto. We've done that class all over the world. I think you can sign up, and we're trying to reach a certain number, and we'll do it again. I have a class on the Patmos book, a class on the mediation of Jesus Christ coming up. There's another class called the Undiluted Gospel. Uh, amazing, amazing. Them. Usually, you'll watch a video. And there's materials that you can do if you read or study if you want to go further. But then we all get together online at a certain time and just have like two-hour conversations. It's just, I mean, it's like, come on, man. Nobody wants them to end. It's like, you know, we have to say, no, we're going we're gonna to stop it. But we'll, we'll do it again. And so uh, I do a lot of those in a lot of podcasts, of course. And But then there's one ongoing class that I do the first Tuesday of the month, uh, which is tomorrow night, as a matter of fact. Um, and it's uh, called Baxter Live Across All Worlds, and we have been studying through John's Gospel together, and I'll teach for about 30 minutes, sometimes 45, and then we'll talk about it, and we're in chapter 18 right now, and mm -hmm. and all of that's been recorded, and when you sign up and become a member of the, the whatever, the Patreon or whatever, you mm -hmm. get access to all of the recordings, so you can watch, you can go back, and we've got lots of people that are joining now, and they're going back and, and coming up to speed, and and what a place to be. I mean, John 18 is in the crucifixion. Um, so we'll be into that tomorrow. Um, first Tuesday of the month, at, I think 730 uh, Eastern time. So 730 Central time, Central time. Um, yeah. and, and there'll be other things that are coming. So, um, wow. On the website. Wow. Well, I don't know if, uh, if you remember this, uh, and I don't expect you to because you meet thousands of people a year. But we actually had uh, dinner together at UC Davis uh, six years ago in a little outdoor setting cafe before we moved over to the uh, to the school. And that's the first time I heard you, you know, uh, start to unpack the face to face pros from John one. And uh, so so thank you for, you know, here I feel like here it is six years later and I'm just we're just. Things are just getting better and better and better uh, because that's what freedom does, right? Uh, so I just I want I just keep saying thank you. I, I know it's I know it's the Lord. I know it's His goodness. I know He's doing it with you, but He also requires a yes in our hearts. And I appreciate your yes a, a ton, Baxter. Thank you very much, brother. That's a, very encouraging. It's what keeps me going. <laughs> Come on.